It's hard to believe it's been 10 years since Eidos Montreal faced the seemingly impossible task of rebooting the greatest shooter of all time and the premier cyberpunk immersive sim Deus Ex for a new, bigger audience. While Deus Ex Human Revolution still plays like a contemporary game that could release today, expectations in gameplay and graphics had changed substantially between then and when the original game began development in 1997. In tackling a new Deus Ex game, they faced the innovator's dilemma. What do you keep to appease an existing passionate fanbase, and what do you introduce to entice new customers? In the year 2027, you play Adam Jensen, the security chief at Seraph Industries, a company looking to change the world with modular biotech augmentations. When a group of highly trained mercenaries raid your labs, kill your brilliant scientist partner, and leave you for dead, your boss decides to augment you without your consent, setting the stage for the uncovering and unraveling of a massive conspiracy that holds technological progress in check. You'll fight, stealth, hack, and talk your way through the game situations as you see fit. The prequel released to critical and commercial success, and I enjoyed it, but as a longtime fan of the original game and an apologist for its <clears throat> misguided sequel, Invisible War, something wasn't quite right about the new, expensive effort. There was something about Human Revolution that didn't quite add up until I played through it again for this 10th anniversary review. I'm more than happy to dive deep and explore where Eidos Montreal succeeded and where they didn't quite pull it off. It may not be the first, but it is the nth review for 2011's Deus Ex Human Revolution, episode number 14, brought to you by my supporters on Patreon at patreon.com slash the nth review. You're a ghost, a fucking tragedy. Everything you touch, everything that touches you dies. Oh, look, Seraph's attack dog. Sarif really had to pay you more. Straight to business, a rare quality these days. We can improve the lives of everyone, but only if we fix this. Let's put this plan of yours into action. Hey, and uh, Jensen, I just wanted to say, new look suits you. Just be careful, Adam, because everybody lies. Before we get too far into this, because I know it's going to go long, I highly recommend you check out my previous reviews in the Deus Ex series. My 2016 review of Deus Ex Mankind Divided has my thoughts on the whole series, including some early ones on Human Revolution. My 2020 review of the original game is just, I mean, it's the greatest shooter of all time, so just a heads up. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're watching this, you might have already seen it anyway. Also, if you're watching this review, I assume you have a base understanding of what the Deus Ex series is and what an immersive sim is. A lot of this review may fly right over your head if you don't, but I try to tie it all together anyway. In 2007, Eidos, the publisher of gaming favorites like Tomb Raider, Thief, Hitman, and Deus Ex, set up a new studio in the cultured Canadian burg of Montreal, less than 50 miles from the American border and the rural backwoods of New England. I think we older millennials might imagine Montreal game development and think of Ubisoft Montreal. They were the first big publisher to set up shop there thanks to some very beneficial Quebecois tax benefits and an established technical community, but also beneficial tax benefits. From Ubisoft Montreal, we get important titles like Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell, Far Cry 2, but then Far Cry 3, and well, every subsequent one of those. Also, here's Assassin's Creed, and a bunch more of those. And Watch Dogs, which served as the subject of my very first Nth review, which you should also check out. EA and others also set up in Montreal, so it made sense that if IDOS were going to set up a new North American hub for game development, it's going to take advantage of the Montreal development scene. When it came out that Eidos Montreal's first game was Deus Ex 3, and not because of some corporate mandate, but because the developers in Montreal were actually big fans of the series, that was exciting. They played through and studied Ion Storm's games and made notes about the best way to make a new game without any of the original staff involved. I take that back. They did eventually consult Sheldon Picotti, the writer of the first two games, so they weren't completely unmoored from the Deus Ex universe. 
Their Deus Ex sought to include the core features of the series, immersive simulation gameplay that provides a variety of methods to complete goals, cyberpunk aesthetic and functionality, and a complex narrative involving a large cast of involved players trying to change the world for heady, philosophical reasons. IDOS equipped the Montreal team with a far bigger budget than Ion Storm Austin ever enjoyed, a staff of 80, which was substantially larger than the Ion Storm Austin teams, and granted them two years to make their game, even if eventually it took longer. In 2009, Square Enix bought IDOS and rebranded it Square Enix Europe. Not only did this stabilize their position financially, but it granted the Montreal team access to their new publisher's world-famous CGI team, Visual Works, who crafted the game's incredible cinematics, alongside the more documentary-style live-action cutscenes created by Vancouver-based Goldtooth. When the game was finally announced to the world, the early concept art razzled and dazzled, getting me excited for their new game even if it was still years away. Eidos Montreal was extremely ambitious, biting off far more than they could chew. Even with the more expensive production resources and the sheer amount of content that wound up making it into the game, the team still had to cut corners and outsource content, leading to some of its most critically and fan-reviled features the action-oriented boss battles, and the game's conclusion. I want to let you know that while I did play the base game when it was released, for this review I played the 2013 Director's Cut that features all of the game's DLC content, some fixes, additional items, and most importantly, for those who hated them, revisions to the game's boss battles. I'll be pointing out these differences as we move along. But the Montreal team's biggest and most vital decision may have been to not make a sequel to the original game at all but a prequel, and they weren't the first ones to think of it. In the wake of both Deus Ex Invisible War and Thief Deadly Shadows commercial failures, Ion Storm Austin was scrambling to come up with a sequel pitches to gain an extra life from parent company and publisher IDOS. I talked about Ion Storm's Thief 4 pitch in my 5 hour long Thief series review, so you should check that out. But Warren Spector and his team were interested in making another Deus Ex game as well, and IDOS would eventually receive three pitches to continue the series. The first game was Deus Ex Insurrection and was set 25 years before the original game, focusing on American patriots working against globalists based out of Europe. Reading the pitch reads like a real militarized version of National Treasure. You would have had a home base to operate out of, supposedly a military transport, that would have been a more functional space between missions than Unatco HQ was in the original game. Insurrection was abandoned when Warren Spector and lead producer Art Min left Ion Storm to found Junction Point, which was later bought by Disney to make the epic Mickey games. Siloed away from the Insurrection team at Ion Storm, designer Jordan Thomas took charge of another Deus Ex 3, which also took place years before the original game. Thomas was probably best known at that point for his work designing the Shale Bridge Cradle level for Thief Deadly Shadows, and would later go on to be a lead designer and writer for the Bioshock games. In this game, you are a biotech product reject who became a mercenary, ultimately out for revenge against the negligent corporation who left them in a scrap heap. This version was abandoned when IDOS shut down Ion Storm entirely. But before that was done, a third Deus Ex 3 was in development at sister studio Crystal Dynamics with assistance from Ion Storm. The game wound up spinning away from the Deus Ex lore, becoming its own game with a new title, Project Snowblind. Most importantly, this game wound up on store shelves. Today, it's been largely forgotten, except for the fact that it was once a Deus Ex game. Considering all the sliding tile nonsense IDOS was pulling off with all these different Deus Ex projects, it's genuinely surprising that they would give their brand new Montreal studio seemingly unlimited resources just a couple years later to pull their game together. Despite being called Deus Ex 3 well into production, Montreal's game was also planned as a prequel to the original game, set in the far off year of 2027, as to not be stuck in a post Deus Ex 1 universe trying to make sense of that game's ending like Invisible War had to. But what theme would they choose to rest an entire Deus Ex class narrative on, especially in a prequel? 
Ion Storm built the first game on a mesh of science fiction conspiracies and tropes, back when conspiracies were considerably more harmless. For 2003's Invisible War, they'd pretty much exhausted all of their pop culture references, so to make any sense of Invisible War, you had to play Deus Ex. I suppose there are worse things. Eidos Montreal wisely fell in love with transhumanism for their game. I touched on how technology is embracing humanity in my Mankind Divided review, but they chose to portray an inflection point of human development in the Deus Ex universe with all of the ethical and political considerations that go along with it. And I think it was a slam dunk. It makes sense then that their game would become Deus Ex Human Revolution, portraying a near future where it's clear that natural biological evolution is going too slow for our increasing capacities and imagination, and we've developed the technology to enhance what our bodies can't do on their own. The setting and theme of Human Revolution even helps to present the mechanical and nano-augmented divide of the first game at an earlier time where people are being enhanced by very visible, even audible hardware, software, and wetware that makes people look partially robotic versus the invisible nanotechnology that augments the like of J.C. Denton. As developers, Montreal was clearly excited about the future these technologies could produce and their game suggests. Still, you can't portray mass transhumanism without some sort of nearly religious rejection of human augmentation. And so Human Revolution also portrays the hateful purists who believe that human bodies should not be the playgrounds for technologists and corporate interests. Hell, the logo for the premier anti-enhancement group is a sperm cell. Human Revolution also portrays the tax that these augmented people face in the form of the anti-rejection drug neuropazine, forcing them to become biological and financially dependent on it to maintain their new standard of living. In one way, it reflects this post-COVID America and its working class that struggles to maintain and acquire even basic human needs. In another, it reflects a societal control administered by a privileged and powerful few that's only a few steps away from the Grey Death Plague and Ambrosia Vaccine duo that starred in the original game. But I'm getting ahead of myself. With a much larger canvas and far more paint, Human Revolution dares to create a much larger world than the original game. They retcon an entire moment in Deus Ex history with all of the political tectonics that inform it. Of course, the danger of being a new team writing a prequel is that all of the major important people, organizations, locations, and events that Human Revolution presents, all now vitally important to the Deus Ex universe, never wind up referenced in the original game's lore. Because, well, they, they don't exist. On the flip side, Human Revolution makes plenty of stringy references to the original game. You'll find Versalife, Bob Page, Joseph Manderly, Senator Philip Meade, Morgan Everett, and more. More. Beyond being fan service, these spider-like threads are a reminder that you're still playing in the Deus Ex universe when most everything else about this game is trying to convince you otherwise. But that issue goes a little deeper. Nothing against Austin and the Ion Storm studio that once stood there, but there was something in my art brain that flickered to life knowing that this was going to be a game produced in Montreal. The melding of North American and European sensibilities in a very French-speaking city and province. From the very first concept art, it was clear that one of Human Revolution's big new priorities for a Deus Ex game was art direction. The Ion Storm games are a lot of things, but I would not call either game pretty. While both games were powered by early versions of Unreal, the art in either Ion Storm game felt undercooked, inconsistent, or at its worst, ugly. Montreal developed a very clear art direction with Human Revolution, empowered by how far graphics had improved in the odds. One of the first, most striking elements of Human Revolution's art is its black and gold aesthetic that visually unifies the game. Moving through these environments, I noticed times where there seemed to be a visual cross-pollination with the 2014 Thief reboot being developed by a sister team at Eidos Montreal. And of course, since this is the future, Montreal could create architecture and artwork based on intentionally polygonal designs rather than the necessary polygons that all 3D games require. In a very scientific poll in the Nth Review YouTube community, nearly half of respondents believe that triangles are the best polygons but a strong showing for the bestagon came close. Black and gold triangles describe so much of what you'll see in Human Revolution, from the menus, to the vests, to the world design, to even the redone word mark. The architecture and level design is so stunning in Human Revolution that many times, like I did on Gorgon in The Outer Worlds, I 
stopped and just admired it, my brain filling with plans to furnish a dream house with what they designed to fill these levels. Most games ignore ceilings, but not Human Revolution, with its swarms of dangling things, abstract decorations, and suspended textures. And look, here's a video display with a thumb on it for some reason. All of the broader architecture in this game seems to be inspired by the late Iraqi British architect Zaha Hadid. Rest in peace, lady. The styling is beautiful and well executed with its take on polygonal and organic looking structures that seem so futuristic in the late aughts and have lost little power in their effect playing Human Revolution today. There are parts of these cities that aren't entirely inspired by the Hadid style, but I think Mankind Divided's Prague pulls off the contrast between old and new better. At the same time, Montreal sought a Victorian slash neo-renaissance look to reflect the cybernetic renaissance of this section of Deus Ex history. You see this in the early teasers portraying Adam Jensen as Icarus, but it permeates the style of female fashion with billowing ruffs, cuffs, and collars, bodices, and elaborate skirts, all updated with 21st century polygonal style. You also see it in the sepia-toned real-time visuals, which is affectionately dubbed the piss filter, that was removed in the director's cut. The most successful thing that Eidos Montreal pulls off artistically is a sense of universality, of internationality. Deus Ex and to a lesser extent Invisible War, even as they trot the globe, still feel and very much look like American locations aesthetically. It's really not a surprise in doing my research for this review that Ion Storm's Deus Ex 3 pitches were very much focused on American quote-unquote patriots versus a sense of humanity at large. Even the conspiracies that Deus Ex builds on are distinctly American, like Area 51, The Men in Black, or FEMA-managed black sites that are conspiratorial folklore involving the American federal government. That you fly around the world from there is almost incidental. With their games, the Eidos Montreal team embraces a kind of look and feel that transcends the aesthetic and institutions of the United States to portray a world that feels bigger and more substantial. But despite how much I enjoy and have been thoroughly impressed by the presentation of Human Revolution, I do have some nitpicks and broader concerns. The faces of these inhabitants are more detailed than ever for a Deus Ex game, but they get duplicated quite a bit, a sin repeated in Mankind Divided. Some faces are clearly more stylized and exaggerated, particularly Dr. Megan Reed, the game's emotional linchpin, occupying a kind of weird space where they weren't sure how stylized these characters should be, and I'm left a little puzzled myself. Characters with coats tend to have really big coats, probably for clipping and mesh reasons, which makes their heads and hands look disproportionately small. Conversations will have weird micro-cuts between sentences that are completely unnecessary and visually irritating. And then there's the game's distinctive black and gold color scheme that is at times extremely striking, but combined with the game's piss filter, really mutes the color space. Say what you will about the graphics of the first two games, despite being almost entirely cloaked in darkness, they really produce some vivid scenes, especially when you're in Hong Kong or Cairo. Here, it renders the game monochromatic at times, and literally so in others, but for different artsier reasons. Again, the director's cut removes the visual filter, but it doesn't quite rebalance the colors of the rest of the world, so it looks a lot less like piss, but still visually muted at its best moments. You'll really notice the difference between what originally shipped with the game and the director's cut as you transition to and from the pre-rendered cutscenes, which are not only higher contrast and warmer, but feature some hazy compression as well. The load screens and UI bits, both practical and fictional, feature a lot of frilly technical detail that was in vogue in the late 90s and early aughts, but just distracts in 2011. It's art for the sake of art that's just distracting. As flat minimalist art became more popular in the following years, Mankind Divided shed the visual excess, leading to a cleaner, more useful look. Also, the tabs of your mandatory menu interface are different sizes, which is an odd oversight considering how often you flip through them. And then there's the architecture and international look I mentioned earlier. It's really innovative, it's great to look at and interact with, and it really sets a distinct tone to the game. But you will probably get tired of the polygonal slash organic look long before the game wraps up. 
It makes even the most distant corners of the globe look similar. The Taiyong Medical Tower looks nearly identical to the Detroit Convention Center, which looks similar to the Picus upper level offices. This polygonal style threads through the entire game, from the architecture to the UI, and it just gets old through uniform application. Well done application, but uniform nonetheless. But when you pull back and look at its place within the Deus Ex canon, it doesn't help that among the first three games, there is no visual consistency among them. There is no shared visual language, and there are essentially zero visual tropes that carry between games. And then we get into anachronisms. The original Deus Ex takes place in 2052 because in 1997, Warren Spector believed that the world they were making for the first game could possibly exist 55 years out. Human Revolution presents an extreme case of Star Wars prequel trilogy syndrome by creating a world that exists 25 years before the first game that looks impossibly futuristic. It has double-decker cities with technology that looks entirely science fiction, whereas the original game still feels grim, dark, dirty, street level, and oddly enough, modern. Human Revolution looks like the world of 2527, not 2027. I've teased the notion before, but this canonical anachronism makes Human Revolution look and feel like it could be easily disconnected from the first game, which is actually a valid criticism of Invisible War as well. And while the narrative of Invisible War is intrinsically tied to the original game, there really isn't much connective tissue to snip before Human Revolution could be its own standalone experience and IP. Now, would it have sold nearly as many copies as an immersive sim without the big Deus Ex badge on the front, competing as an original IP like Dishonored or Mass Effect? I have no idea. But that Deus Ex bond and badging is why I bought Human Revolution a decade ago and not those other games, uh, at least not immediately. Technically, this game still holds up, but in spots it's clear that it's rooted in the graphics technology of the late aughts. Environments can feel kind of spare despite all the non-interactive props, which I realize is kind of ironic considering how big and empty the levels of Deus Ex could be. You honestly may not even notice that most of the game looks older until you get into the Missing Link DLC which released just a few months after the game did, where Montreal was able to implement newer graphical techniques and detail in these environments, like this cool cryo steam. I do have to note that it was there in Missing Link that I noticed fun little things like like reflection maps that looked like Panchea, despite being in the middle of a dark bell tower cargo ship, or this um, <clears throat> digital soup. And sometimes assets pop in. Sometimes. Rarely. The physics in this game are fun, but simple. You'll drag bodies around to hide them from their buddies and pick up boxes to use them as shields. From time to time, you can even stack crates to reach less than accessible areas. Everything in here weighs half a pound, apparently, which you notice as soon as you move even the heaviest objects or toss them for, say, deterrence purposes? The last thing I want to touch on in the presentation before we dive into the mechanics of Human Revolution is the score by Michael McCann, and it's really good. Utilizing a more traditional arrangement of synths, strings, and haunting vocals, McCann brings a very hard-nosed and cinematic sound to the game with a theme you can throw into any Get Pumped playlist. As epic as McCann's score can be, it just can't match the quirky character of the MOD track files from the original game. And it's beyond nostalgia. Alexander Brandon's themes for different locales each present a distinct urgency and add fun cyberpunk flavor to the surroundings. When I hear a particular Brandon song, I'm immediately pulled back to wherever it was planted. It may have been lower fidelity music, but whenever I passed by a speaker playing one of these original Brandon tunes in this new game, I was immediately back to places I'd visited or infiltrated over the past 20 years. A decade after Human Revolution's release, I can't say the same about McCann's score. What? You, you mean you aren't going to pay? But I risked everything to get you that file! Chalk it up to a learning experience and move on. You, you... So you have a license to one of the most beloved immersive sims ever and the resources to bring it to life. How do you update the gameplay, especially in a world where Gears of War, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, and Assassin's Creed exist? Or do you? 
Deus Ex isn't just a wildly hailed immersive sim, it is literally the father of the genre. While others had come before, the term didn't even exist until Warren Spector created it for his post-mortem of the game. Putting a decade between the original game and Human Revolution let Montreal experiment with new things, or integrate things that were still blasphemous, like the third-person cover system, the staged melee attacks, or recharging health. I mentioned earlier that Montreal were already fans of the series and replayed the first two games, and there is plenty to harvest. From the first, it's what to put in. From the second, it's what to take out. From this chimera came four main priorities for the team. Combat, stealth, hacking, and dialogue, which we'll break down individually. But we do have some gameplay adjacent and specific topics to go over first. It makes sense in talking about architecture earlier that technology and money allowed Eidos Montreal to create a world that feels fuller and more alive compared to the empty, largely grid-based levels of the original game. There are a lot of beautiful areas here, even beautiful floors. Like how they remodeled these apartment buildings in Detroit with this like textured tiling that looks like a notebook I would have bought in 7th grade. There are fancy office parks that are very fancy. There are lots of fun explorations in lighting with tubes, either globally or as props. And of course, there are polygons forever. There are lots of little moments where you can stop and admire the details, and it usually feels like you have elbow room, unlike Invisible War. It was hard to resist the urge no matter where I was at, no matter how taut the dramatic tension at that moment, to indulge my immersive sim routine of leaving no stone left unturned in every new place I worked through. I mean, who knows what I'd uncover if I just looked a little bit further and checked every single desk. There are lots of doors to open and toilets to flush and faucets to turn on. There are bays of lockers that remind me a whole lot of Thief 2's Shoalsgate Station, and there's a non-trivial chance that there's something interesting in each new compartment, like money, ammo, XP bonuses, backways, or vents. There are people everywhere and the world feels alive compared to the empty and somewhat apocalyptic environments of the original game. You can get drunk because of course, and after all these years I still can't sink a hoop or net drop a ball. <sighs> Sports. But at a top level, Montreal's biggest contribution to Deus Ex canon level design, for better and worse, is scores and scores of non-interactive crap. These levels, all of them, are plump to the gills with non-interactive props. Nearly everything in the first two games could be picked up or manipulated. In Human Revolution, only a handful of items aren't nailed down. Compare the open-air shops of Deus Ex's Hong Kong, where nearly everything is up for grabs, to Human Revolution stores in Hengsha, where only the human vendor and maybe a backdoor are interactive while the rest is static. With so many non-interactive props everywhere, it's kind of a miracle that you can find the useful gameplay items in these environments, which I credit to clever object design. It's something I wish The Outer Worlds was far better at. The big technical reason why so much of this world's props are non-interactive is how taxing it would have been on the physics model, which makes sense for a game released a decade ago. Oh, how I wish we could toss one of the game's many pre-made cardboard boxes into the plentiful ceiling decorations. Unfortunately, while all these things make the levels feel fuller, more realistic, and higher fidelity, they paradoxically lead to an aesthetic in which the world feels emptier and contained, like marching past countless paintings hanging behind glass. The environments don't feel like they're full of possibility, and your eyes and interactive cursor glide right off nearly everything in the game. You just want to run past everything because you know that your chances of engaging with anything in particular are virtually none. They make the world feel more forgettable. On the plus side, Human Revolution features a very nice map to ensure you can navigate its somewhat complex spaces. Yeah, it was easy for Deus Ex to hand you a note and say, this is how you get around, requiring you to meet the game halfway on figuring out how these levels worked. But Human Revolution doesn't take any chances. These maps are very clean and easy to navigate, but its one primary failing is in not being able to describe vertical traversal, because everything is projected in two-dimensional slices. Being able to understand and keep track of these ins and outs is an important thing in a vertical environment like Hengsha. Perhaps if they'd layered the levels closer together, maybe that 
could have worked. Like other immersive sims, the world is full of literature and leaflets to read and distract you, from e-readers and emails to newspapers and pocket secretaries. If you're diligent, you'll find lots of valuable information, like key codes and login information that make progressing non-lethally easier, or just to make life easier altogether. There are lots of computer terminals to hack, but there's also plenty of editorializing in this world as a result of, or parallel to, what you're doing in the game. Sadly, you'll find no slivers of noirish fiction like you do in the original game, but plenty of office gossip. There's still plenty to read here if you need a flavor text reprieve, though. In Fine Deus Ex Tradition, there are all the same alternate ways to get around through alternate paths, like vents, which are usually hidden behind boxes. While I'm concerned about the usefulness of any vent that's blocked by a big crate, which is really designed to gate progress if you haven't upgraded your strength aug, I'm very concerned about the necessity for man-sized vents in nearly uniform construction everywhere that are completely dust-free. If you encounter a locked door, or an enemy you can't overcome, or a hack you just can't hack, there's typically some third or fourth way to get around, like vents. While I found a lot of vent systems that would have made life easier after the fact, they tended to serve as a crutch, and eventually any time I found one, I had to giggle a little. In early stages of the game, you'll encounter plenty of spaces or rooms you can't access, and that actually gives you a big reason to engage in the game's New Game Plus mode, in which you can continue with all of your existing modifications after beating the game. It's pretty cool, but if you're not the type to immediately hop back into a game once you finish it, this might not be something you realize you're missing. Human Revolution's levels are divided into two classes, Dungeons and Hubs. Dungeons are objective-based mishmashes of narrow hallways and combat arenas that are designed to funnel you through a variety of challenges. These challenges will vary based on what skills you've put Praxis points into, or just how you like playing games. Although some situations are better or worse based on those, which will periodically force you to try things you may not be comfortable with. Most of the game's levels are dungeons. Despite all the technical tricks with populations of objects or people, or the art direction and architecture, these dungeons are typically constrictive. And you may think, well, these are basically murder tunnels, that's sort of the point, and to an extent you'd be right. However, there are plenty of examples in the original game of big non-linear spaces that aren't specifically combat arenas or murder tunnels, like Majestic 12 Occupied Paris, that give you lots of maneuverability and options, even side quests. It reminds me of the issues I talked about in my Outer Worlds review, where spaces are shrink-wrapped down and populated with attractions just beyond the horizon to appease players who need dangling environmental carrots to maintain interest. This means there's very little breathing room in these spaces, which sometimes draws comparisons to the shoebox-sized levels of Invisible War. It really does feel like you're going from hallway to big room to another hallway to another big room. Big outdoor spaces may have ground the original game to a halt, but they employed the player to take full advantage of the space and fill their heads with possibilities. You literally had space to move around in, to survey, and plan. There is no Liberty Island, Battery Park, Subpen, or even Area 51 here. There's room to maneuver, but not much more. It makes you feel like you have fewer choices, even if sometimes, based on the amount of vents or terminals or tools at your disposal, you literally have more choices, because the game overplots your choices within these spaces and then tosses out a lot of improvisation that was so attractive and essential in the original game. The worst offender of this is the Missing Link DLC, which features tons of consecutive corridors and arenas in a cramped ship with lots of backtracking and lengthy security checkpoint scanning sequences you have to experience over and over. We'll come back to this. And then there are hubs, which are big urban areas to gather and complete quests with more serendipitous encounters and smaller points of interest. In Human Revolution, there are two, Detroit and Hengsha, both of which you'll revisit a few times. These areas are fun to wander around, but still have no big spaces that make you believe people do things like drive despite having streets. Nor is there really much to explore beyond the beaten path unless you like exploring samey-looking apartment complexes with really cool floors. 
Hubs are interesting spaces because they still never feel as open as some of the original game's hub spaces, so you usually feel like these are just conduits to move you between missions. Unlike dungeons, thankfully, there are more things to do here, and you're not under time or hostile pressure to move through them as quickly as possible. There are fancy cars and bikes here, but never any crappy ones. I guess they immediately recycle slightly dated vehicles in the future of 2027. There are storefronts to gawk at and a couple vendors to buy from and sell to, but they aren't marked on your map. And in Hengshaw, they'll move, making them a hard thing to find when you need them because you can't just ask where they are. Limb clinics are your one-stop augmentation shop. They're easily found, branded larger than life, and allow you to buy Praxis points and AUG-related ammo and supplies that you need that aren't doled out by the levels or from your experience. Of course, hubs feature homeless huddled around flaming barrels, philosophizing about how the world has done them wrong, which is a staple of the series, and uh, a whole lot of other games too. Hubs are fun to wander around, and while it's not an open world game, it does present a size and a freedom that the previous games couldn't really handle, even if, paradoxically, they feel more constrictive. The game doesn't actually advise you that a space you're loading into is a dungeon or a hub, that's just what I call them. Instead, you just kind of understand whenever you're traveling to or from Detroit or Hengshaw that you're going to be entering a tight space to exercise your favorite Deus Ex skills before you get to go to the next hub section. I wish the game took a more tempered approach to these spaces, like the original game did where one area isn't so clearly a murder tunnel and the other so clearly a circular hub space. Deus Ex gave you dungeons with side quests and hubs with more danger. The variety was just better then. Human Revolution does well to not place more than two dungeons in a row, although it does sort of give up in the last third. When you're moving through environment after environment in which you are the sole persistent threat to the status quo, it puts that player in a more persistent, anxious danger mode. Considering these spaces are so much more claustrophobic and tightly wound than the seemingly oversized levels of the original game, you feel like you're literally in a gameplay funnel stripped of your liberty, or you just feel ennui, like, oh great, here's another hour or two of me shooting from cover, patiently waiting for takedowns from patrolling guards, and probing every stack of boxes for a hidden vent. Coming off the Outer Worlds, it was great to have quests that relate to you and your character, rather than treating you as a savior figure who has to solve everything. I mean, you will eventually become a savior figure who has to solve everything, but the people asking you for help are typically co-workers or old acquaintances. These quests are divided into the golden main quests and the aqua-colored side quests. Main quests pull you along the story and facilitate big actions in the game, or steps in your investigation of the attack at Seraph Industries. Side quests are more organic and something you typically need to search out. Your ability to find and complete side quests will be based on your progress with the main quest, so there will be several checkpoints where you'll be unable to complete specific side quests if you choose to push the main narrative forward. Toward the end of my first stint in Detroit, I crawled deep into gang territory to complete a main quest, only to realize I would have had to give up all the side quests I'd loaded up on if I told a just landing Malik that I was ready to bounce. So what did I do? I crawled all the way back through the gang stronghold without drawing attention so I could complete a few outstanding side quests. Fun. But Human Revolution's quest system has a major systemic flaw. Virtually everything you do is siloed from each other. The main quest doesn't ever care what side quests you do. The side quests don't ever care what the other quests you do. Nothing talks to each other, or they rarely ever do. What the Ion Storm games did repeatedly was remind you that it was keeping track of what you were doing for narrative and logistical reasons. Conversations and tasks changed in the world if characters knew you had completed other objectives or taken action before you talked to the quest givers in the level's playgrounds. The original game is full of these simple little contraptions and there's virtually none of the socketing going on in the newer game. Dialogue in the older game changed based on how you completed missions. I genuinely didn't notice that happening here at all. To that end, I would have been more shocked when Pritchard ragged on me about going into the women's restroom and overhearing a conversation between stalls, a callback to when Manderley does it in the first game. If it weren't just that, a simple callback, a dash of fan service, the game rarely surprises you with little task-based tricks like this. 
With the main quests serving as checkpoints, there are no callbacks or long plays. There are no setups and then payoffs along the length of the game. Except for this one, which I'll talk about later. Despite revisiting Detroit and Hengshaw, there are no follow-up quests from the previous time you visited to engage the player and make them feel like they had any impact on the world at all. Once a quest line is done, it's zipped off and off to the rubbish bin like it never happened. To that end, I didn't really care a whole lot about what was going on in here anyway. Yeah, these are your coworkers and acquaintances, but I genuinely didn't care about any of these people, like this guy or this lady. So many people in this game are set up just to dole out a mundane task, and then they're gone. Only memorable in how forgettable they are, or how much I wanted them to take bigger roles and they never would. It's a far cry from the relationships you build up back at Unaco. Switching tracks, augmentations, or augs, are your powers. They seem like old hat in the two decades since Deus Ex came out in a time where every action game has talent trees, but they're a big deal in Human Revolution. While Eidos Montreal deferred to the suggestions or lessons of the first game, this is one area where I think they wisely chose to side with Invisible War's design choices. Remember, Deus Ex 1 had skills in addition to augs, which made their augs... How do I put this? Kinda lame. The most important augs that I used in the first game were the flashlight, which you don't need in Human Revolution, and the health recharger, which you don't need here either. There are many skills and then augs that did the same thing, making them redundant. Invisible War took out the skills entirely and made more powerful and distinctive augs. But you don't find or buy these augmentations as separate pieces of kit like you do in the older games. There are no augmentation canisters hanging out in the wild. In Human Revolution, all of your augs are built in, and you use Praxis points to unlock and upgrade them by acquiring experience points, which means doing virtually anything in the game, or buying them with cold hard digital cash. While you'll typically finish the game with more augmentations than you could ever need, especially if you're doing nearly every side quest and searching behind every dumpster like I did, there are plenty of times in the early and mid game where you need to make some tough decisions about how you want to enhance your character. Do you increase the level of terminals you can hack or do you increase your inventory space? Do you add the ability to punch through walls or manipulate conversations? There's a tension early on where every challenge presents a kind of doubt where you wonder if you made a mistake choosing one AUG over another. This tension is relieved later in the game, but even more so if you take advantage of the new game plus mode. Praxis points are gated because flipping on all these abilities at once is supposed to be physically and mentally traumatic for Adam. But allowing you to purchase Praxis points with dollars found around the world makes you wonder why, even if your boss Seraph gave you a few abilities to start with, he didn't just fill you out entirely, considering how important your mission is to him. Of course, the real reason why you don't unlock everything from the beginning is because it would rob you of any meaningful character progression. So there. Since the Missing Link DLC needed a big mechanical gotcha when it arrives late in the game, it robs you of all of your Praxis points and abilities, and then doles them back over the course of its 6 hour mission. Some immediately, but many at the end. This is supremely irritating if there are a suite of abilities that you relied on or just acquired. Do you remember what abilities you had before they're instantly taken from you? The entire conceit doesn't even exist in the base game, so it's just annoying. Your active augmentations, like the melee takedowns or wall hole manufacturing, require energy cells to activate, which can be upgraded. If you're playing on the highest difficulty, like I was, your like body system only automatically recharges your first energy cell, even if you have multiple cells. This means you constantly need to load up and ingest energy pills and whatever if you want to use more than one ability without waiting for it to recharge. It's more irritating than challenging. It would also be neat if the UI enlisted a visual or audio cue whenever these cells top off, rather than counting pixels. Before we address the game's four core mechanics, I want to talk about how the game introduces itself, and that's with a prologue. You as player protagonist Adam Jensen engage in a non-interactive walk and talk that has you trailing your brilliant girlfriend, the visionary Dr. Megan Reed, as she engages in small talk with her scientist co-workers you quickly forget about. While meeting your boss David Seraph, the attack on your labs begin and you gain some agency. You quickly get used to shooting and hiding and cover, as well as picking up random stuff that isn't nailed down. 
It felt wise to watch the minutes long tutorial videos that explain huge chunks of gameplay, and these pepper the game's first few hours. The prologue is a tutorial antechamber like the training ranges of the first game, and I kept wondering if there was a less video dumpy way to present all of this information. You don't worry about your health or ammo, you just shoot up meaningless enemies and watch your coworkers get annihilated by high tech assassins. After you're nearly dispatched and augmented and all the fun stuff that we'll get into more detail later, you're probably scrounging the Seraph offices before setting out on your first linear dungeon. Actually, I guess it would be your second one. There is no Liberty Island here to test your abilities or get you thinking critically about how to use the many tools the game gives you. Your boss describes the Milwaukee Junction facility very simply when asking how you want to handle the situation, which describes many of the other dungeons you'll run into later. You remember what it's like in there? A lot of tight and closed hallways, but the labs themselves are pretty open. High ceilings. I wager the reason they didn't go for a big Liberty Island approach is that they wanted to present options slowly with one or two enemies at a time, whether it's tranking a dude, knocking them out, shooting them dead, or sneaking by entirely. This approach is much safer, but gives you the latitude to try any of these options without facing severe consequences or losing a lot of progress. This game has a lot of mechanics, and is deathly afraid of dumping them all on you at once. I think it works considering when it was released, and Montreal didn't want to piss off their new potentially much larger audience. At the same time, I can see how this approach would irritate longtime fans who don't want the pedantry. By the way, I've waxed plenty about how much I love Liberty Island as a first mission in my Mankind Divided review, and then again in my Deus Ex review, so there. So now it's time to explore the game's core mechanics. Combat, aka getting things done, blam blam blam. Believe it or not, and longtime fans of this channel will be shocked and potentially appalled by this, but I played Human Revolution on its highest Give Me Deus Ex difficulty, and I didn't think anything of it, which is, you know, something I do think about when staring down a 30 plus hour game. The reason I did this is because if you've ever played a Deus Ex game, you understand that each confrontation is some combination of save scumming and implementing the correct application of tools and skills based on your preferences, like a puzzle. When you get a grasp on the game's four core gameplay mechanics, you'll find that progress rarely ever boils down to how fast or how accurately you can make an opponent dead. Except for the boss battles, which we'll talk about there. Combat never felt perfect in Human Revolution, but it did feel dramatically better than the original game. In updating this game's quality of life to match what would have worked with its contemporaries, it made Deus Ex's shooting at lower skill levels really feel like click and pray dice rolls. Because until you'd upgraded your skills, that's exactly what they were. And trust me, you'll be spraying a lot of ammo into absolutely nothing with the game's cover mechanic, but you'll at least decide when to be ruthlessly inaccurate on a moment by moment basis. Here, combat feels more refined and clean in a way that wasn't really possible in 2000 or 2003 when standards for 3D shooters that were also role-playing games were much lower. When I played Human Revolution at launch a decade ago with its wonderful dust sleeve cover thing, it was on the Xbox 360 with an Xbox 360 controller, and I think it worked great. This time around I decided it was opposite day and played with a mouse and keyboard instead. And I have to admit that sometimes I did miss the radial menus of the controller, even if I had the option to pick up my controller at any time. But then I would miss out on pixel-perfect headshots. Yeah, that was the single reason why I didn't roll back from a sea of keyboard commands and weird real-time primary and secondary inventory selection and sometimes laborious loot selection when looting with the mouse. I could shoot heads with incredible accuracy, and it works with virtually every weapon until you get into the bigger scoped guns. Select your gun, enter iron sights, voila, Call of Duty-esque victory. Recharging health here may seem like a regression, because the first games required you to not only keep medkits on hand for broad health reasons, but to prevent the loss of individual limbs. As I mentioned in my Deus Ex review, trying to make it through the rooftops of the Hell's Kitchen warehouse district with two broken legs sounds like a legitimate problem and an interesting system on paper, but it is an absolute nightmare in progress. 
In the wake of Halo making it okay to automatically recharge your shields, and Call of Duty letting the blood vignette fade from your screen over time, recharging health slots along the rewind feature of the Forza games, I'm getting too old to have to micromanage the gathering and use of healing items when I could be spending that time behind cover scoping out enemy attack vectors while I heal. I don't think it's removing agency, I think it shifts where agency is given. So let's talk about the next big change, melee. In Human Revolution, there is no freeform melee, which collectively caused a sigh of relief among the dozens of us who tried to electro rod an NSF trooper on Liberty Island and were just too far away and missed. And I say Liberty Island because I chucked that prod as soon as I could in favor of loading up on guns, guns, guns! <laughs> This also means that you won't acquire an OP Dragon's Tooth sword halfway through the game to slash through every last thing, person, or crate like a cyberpunk lightsaber in awkward slashathons. Melee is now contextual. If you get within range of an enemy and have at least one energy cell available, that's one of the tiny batteries in the top left corner, remember, you can either knock someone out or viciously murder them. I'll lean on the difference in a bit, but I want to emphasize that regardless of where you're positioned compared to your enemy, when it fades out to black and then cuts back to you performing the takedown, you'll notice that you're almost always restaged. It's like you're pulling off a theatrical production and you and your enemy are trading notes and flashing subtle cues about how you want to roll this out. I'm sure wrestling is precisely like this. Some may balk that you transition to third person for these, but I think it's perfectly acceptable considering the action going on. I think some of these animations go a bit long, which makes them look more careful than injurious, and they could probably get sped up by 10-20% to 20 to heighten the effect, but that's just me. You can even do multiple takedowns with the same power cell if your opponents are next to each other, but I picked up that augmentation right before the missing link and immediately lost it, so I totally forgot about it until I was at the very end. So if you have it, hey, it's pretty cool, uh, I can vouch for it. Then there's Cover, another modern blasphemy for the series. Oh, why did gaming have to change so much in the aughts that we need Adam Jensen to pop into a third person camera to hide behind corners and fight slash scope things out? Here's the thing, it works, and it works well. With the higher difficulty, you feel more dangerous with all these new combat mechanics, but you are also just as vulnerable. The series does not shake off the notion that you are as brittle as glass, even with the dermal armor upgrades, and that you do need some effective means to handle enemies at a variety of distances. This also makes stealth important, which we'll get into in a little bit. From cover, you can examine what's going on down hallways or in open spaces without concern of being spotted. Well, until someone flanks you and spots you, of course. At this point, you can lean out for hipfire quality shooting, although not as good as the pixel accurate stuff we expect from the Iron States. Or we can blind fire, which is almost literally tossing random ammunition in the enemy's direction with little hope of making connections. There is one thing that the AI does in regards to cover that at first, second, third, okay, after quite a few times, it seems really weird. I've got an AI section coming up, but this seems like a deliberate design decision. While in cover, patrolling AI enemies will typically stop just shy of where you're hiding before turning away. How odd. If they walked just a few more steps, they would find the person or enemy who's infiltrated their facility, or raised an alarm, or otherwise spooked them. This phenomenon happened more times than I could count, and I think it's for a single reason. It's a mechanic to make cover safer and reliable. If you're making cover a central Anyone mechanic here? to combat and stealth, it's not fun to use it if it's easily jeopardized. You don't want to fall into a situation where you can't trust cover because guards will walk past you, spot you immediately, and immediately shoot you to death. With this approach, you don't even have to use a melee response to eliminate the patrolling guard. You can simply wait until they walk away and proceed with your business. It's almost chess-like in its governance. If I have one gripe with the cover, it's that exiting is abrupt and weird and never quite feels right. You don't get an animation of Jensen pulling away and the camera swooping in, it's just boink, here you are, first person, 
propped where the camera was before looking at Jensen in cover. Here you go, don't know what else you were expecting. Well, I was expecting something not so jarring. Thank you, human revolution. Grenades are pretty cool. I actually like using gas grenades for the area effect death approach versus the quick and noisy frag destruction. Mines are a cool idea, but they're so rare that I didn't use them. You can nab mine templates to combine with your grenades to make mines, but if you have grenades, why risk their limited supply to make mines that you'll find appropriate far less often? I actually wish you could sticky grenades to walls to become mines like the original game. That was handy. Like the original game, managing your weapons and inventory is a big deal. Even if you are upgrading your inventory, you'll find yourself dropping a prized weapon just to grab a kit to upgrade another weapon. And yeah, you can upgrade weapons, although I wish they retained icons or dog ears indicating that they had been modified, making it easier to weigh the sentimentality of weapons that could be tossed or not. I don't know why you'd ever keep alcohol in your inventory aside for funsies, but you'll sometimes find a bottle of whiskey or wine in there when trying to cram more ammo in your sack. Thankfully, the game is smart about laying out your inventory smartly, so you're not having to micromanage it too much. Despite best intentions, it can be difficult to anticipate future encounters, like when I didn't have enough of the proper firepower to save my pilot Malik after our violent crash in Hengshaw. Like any other encounter, I'm sure there was some way to craft what I had on hand and what augmentations I purchased into an ideal path that could have saved her, but with the number of attempts I made this time around, I still wasn't able to save her here, uh, or a decade ago. There are typically more enemies in each of these encounters versus the older games, owing to the removal of technical and design limitations over time. It makes combat feel like a larger affair with a larger theater, necessitating cover and quick thinking, but at times it does also make the game feel dangerously close to a Call of Duty style shooting gallery if you lean into the game's gunplay as a regular solution. Even with your various methods of disposing enemies, having more of them can make combat combat feel less intimate compared to the one or two at a time encounters that were common to the older games. At a point in the game's last level when augmented workers have been converted into raving hysterical combatants, it felt strange to mow down a dozen of them at a time, even if I'm kind of haphazardly kiting them to a hacked turret, and their health levels are much lower than regular combatants. If there's a stealthy way to handle these segments, especially with this one in a huge long haul, I just don't have the patience to think about it, much less implement it. Human Revolution really liked to push two big flashy combat-oriented solutions to problems. The Typhoon crowd deterrence weapon, and the punching holes through walls with your fist as snapping the poor sap on the other side deterrence, and I basically didn't use either. The Typhoon makes sense if you're regularly throwing yourself in the middle of conflict, Max Payne 2 style, but that was never what I was about, so it never made sense to unlock it. Plus, I kept picking up ammo for it that I would just sell or drop to pick up ammo that I actually needed. In the case of the punching holes through walls thing, I found that despite how many holes I punched through walls, there was only once ever someone on the other side. I'm sure if I'd also picked up the sea enemies through walls og, I would have been able to plot this out better, but the whole thing really seems like a gimmick. Both of them do. This made the ability less than useful except to access hidden vents or other getarounds. Of course, I'd usually only find it after I'd cleaned everything out and didn't need them anymore. But it's time for that AI segment I promised earlier, and I'm here to report that here, in a game, in a series that has reputably not had great AI, this game continues to not have great AI. In fact, most of the time, it's pretty terrible. I can say for certain that I've never been the finest AI sommelier, but in making these reviews, I've really begun to pay attention and develop a taste for the autumnal behavioral notes, especially when the game offers so many different ways to deal with its uh, intelligence. So let me bring up my list of observations, and we'll start with the uh, better stuff. I mentioned that enemy encounters are larger with more enemies than previous games, which would lead you to expect some group dynamics, right? They can flank you, so that's cool. They'll use different weaponry to attack you at different ranges, although they don't have a melee themselves, so they'll shoot you close or mid-range, or try to nade you out at a distance. They do seem to respond to sound, 
which makes fatal takedowns and louder grenades less desirable for causing a scene. But sound doesn't seem to propagate through the levels like it does in, say, an older Thief game. Okay, that all seems fine and dandy. But, then you have things like their hit and miss ability to see you through grates or windows. They don't seem to care if coworkers disappear, only noticing when they spot an unconscious body. Hey, have you seen Ted recently? Is not a common question, even when AI patrol routes are interlocked. The AI is uncurious about a new massive hole in the wall where a colleague once patrolled, and now can't be found for reasons they don't seem to care about. They don't seem to work together or communicate needs in the slightest. They'll walk into your gunfire over and over. How can a group of us tackle that Jensen guy who's hiding behind that cover? Let's just keep shooting at the wall behind him, all of us, while he blind fires at us, eventually killing us all somehow. <laughs> and then, why is there this pile of bodies outside this door? Better walk right through the doorway and find out what's causing all this. Yeah, they all sound like Texans. Similar to the design conceits I mentioned earlier about cover, here's a guard not even reaching the end of this hallway before giving up pursuit, despite clearly seeing me run down it. These bell tower guards in Hengshaw don't seem to mind that I'm hacking open storage lockers right next to them, even as civilians freak out nearby. That might be a policy thing, though. Maybe Bell Tower just doesn't care about private storage lockers. Despite being shot down by Bell Tower troops the second time I'm in Hengshaw, they don't seem to have any urgency to capture me while I'm blatantly walking through the streets. The only person who clearly looks like me, even as I slowly meander past them. Guards will walk into clearly visible mines that kill them, and their colleagues will follow right through. Robots follow one-dimensional paths that don't see you or anything else going on in their routes unless you're directly in their path or you're present when they stop to do their 360 degree scans when they hit a node in their patrol. Enemies will get stuck in level geometry unloading ammunition right next to you, but not into you. Also, enemies will only squeeze off bullets when they see you, so if you're popping in and out of cover trolling them, they'll just keep firing a bullet or two at a time until they need to reload. It's hilarious. This all seems like nitpicking, and it is far better than the original game's AI, despite having bigger and more complex encounters. Several of these I can certainly believe are root-level game mechanic decisions to make it operate with rules that might make less sense in a more realistic game like Human Revolution, and more sense as the Deus Ex Go game. These are the choices you have to make as a game designer, but even in these cases, it does feel incongruent. That enemy teams can't work or communicate together and quickly forget who you are makes sense because in reality, tipping off a single guard would permanently alarm enemies and then bring in an insurmountable number of reinforcements who would search every last corner of the facility until they cleared it versus here where they quickly forget and move on allowing you to play the game after even the smallest mistake. A realistic AI in a game like this would probably make the game unplayable. It would also render the game's stealth mechanic inert. Speaking of which, stealth in Human Revolution serves as a mechanical, even a philosophical pause to the action. It allows you to recover, plan, maneuver, and execute. Or literally execute. If you're a pacifist player, it's a counterpoint, a reason to rarely carry a weapon. Warren Spector once feared that the original game's stealth mechanics would be frowned upon because they weren't as deluxe or as integral as thieves, but they worked. And I think they worked in part because of the latitude granted to the player thanks to the liberal level design and lower population count. With Human Revolution featuring more designed and intentional spaces, stealth feels more essential and codified, but also properly planned for. I think we as gamers tend to think of combat and stealth as mutually exclusive things. Either we gun our way through every stage, or we hide, wait, and non-lethally dispatch enemies as we make our way through, if we interact with them at all. While it's easy to imagine quick, lethal action inside a stealth game like Splinter Cell or Metal Gear Solid, it seems harder to imagine stealth inside an action game like, well, Deus Ex. Even if you scrounge every bullet, shell, and dollar in this game, there really is no way to go all combat in this game before having to seek cover and systematically eliminate opponents one by one. It is possible, however, to go all stealth, minus the boss battles, by using patience as your ammo. 
For me, the Deus Ex games have been about working with a slice of gameplay until it doesn't work, and then switching over, like lanes on a note highway. Cover isn't just an ability to shield you from hailing bullets, even as they cosmetically nip at the edges of whatever you're crouched behind. They allow you to move through space unseen, to wait, transit, deploy, and take control, like an environmental cloak. And yes, the game does offer a personal cloak for up-close encounters or daring exits when things go pear-shaped. Late-game enemies gain this ability as well. The downside of the original game's vast open spaces was that it didn't really telegraph how visible or stealthy you were. Many times when you approached an enemy, they were standing alone, leaving you vulnerable as you approached. This could be clever in its own right, realistic even, but it was hard to gauge how well you were being stealthy this way, especially when none of these games offer light meters to reflect how visible you are to your enemies. An advantage of Human Revolution's tighter, more constrictive levels is that they provide plenty of walls, and uh, chest-high walls, to remove all doubt about how well you're hiding because you're either in cover or you're not. Hiding bodies is especially important when trying to avoid even further open combat, and you'll find that monitoring enemy patrols is paramount, even if they're sadly simplistic. There's probably some moralistic reason to go all stealth on top of the sheer challenge. Obviously, the game doesn't want to judge you into playing one way or another, although your comlink helper gripes at you about it in The Missing Link for some reason. His complaints ultimately fall flat, considering how little it matters to getting through the DLC, much less the rest of the game. Hacking has been completely retooled for Human Revolution, which isn't saying too much considering it was just a diminishing progress bar in the older games. Now it's deluxe, it's fun, and it makes hacking more substantial. It's different in two huge ways. One, it's a whole new minigame, and two, there are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of opportunities to use it. Hacking serves as a third rail to get through levels, allowing you to access privileged information, unlock methods of traversal that weren't otherwise possible, manage the opponent's security system, accomplish bespoke tasks, read emails, and more. It gets so spicy in here. When killing isn't possible, when stealthing isn't going to get you through that door, when you can't find a bloody vent, there's probably a terminal somewhere to make gears turn. This new hacking minigame has a little bit of a learning curve, but once you figure it out, you realize how dastardly clever it is. You have a start point and an end point with nodes in between. Each note will have a takeover value that can be increased or decreased depending on your AUG upgrades, what the enemy AI does, and so forth. If you can reach and take over the end node before an alarmed enemy can trace its way back to your entry point, you win. Terminals range in difficulty and complexity as you get further into the game, and again, you'll encounter plenty of early terminals you can't hack until you start a new game plus run because the game doesn't even unlock the ability until you're well into the Milwaukee Junction mission. The game offers safes with more valuable goods, but the most thrilling hacks you'll pull off are on security terminals, where you can peer in on camera feeds, turn them off entirely, and when properly upgraded, turn the enemy's turrets and robots against them. Sitting securely in a hidden office watching the POV feed of a turret mowing down enemies so you don't have to is single-handedly the most fun thing in the game. I kind of wish there was a game that was just this. While hacking is fun, it can become tedious when you're tackling more difficult terminals over and over, one after the other. The director's cut adds automatic unlocking devices to cut through any lock or terminal immediately if you're just fed up and want to get the thing done. Right. The game is also merciful in making sure that story critical hacks are low level, so even if you don't like hacking at all, you aren't punished for not putting Praxis points towards it. And then there's the chatty chatty bang bang, minus the bang bang. Conversations in Human Revolution are more structured and hierarchical than previous games and primarily serve the game's quest system. They're built like a paper fortune teller, so while the intro and conclusion may vary, the mechanics are the same each time. Conversations in the original game felt more organic and realistic, even if they were simple through lines that required some additional detective work on your part to figure things out which was actually very fun. Even if they feel spare, especially these days, they're economical with your time and attention. You could talk to people just to hear their stories without it becoming a jump off point for a fetch quest. People could just say things. Even chatter between primary characters was succinct while being appropriately cryptic. 
Conversations in Human Revolution are almost always functional for the sake of mechanics rather than narrative. Conversations unfold into the same pattern each time to ensure you have all the details about whatever task you're undertaking. So often, conversations feel like busy work, going through the motions just to ensure you don't miss a vital detail, something it shares with the outer worlds. Where Human Revolution wants to distinguish itself is in its periodic mini-boss encounters, and I want to point out that these are different than the widely reviled full-boss battles. These are conversations in which you're trying to persuade your target to do the right thing, which is only one thing. There's only one good solution and one bad solution. You're not establishing and pushing your target toward one out of a spectrum of options based on the game's political spectrums or variety of factions like you would in an actual role-playing game. Honestly, while these aren't as offensive as the physical boss battles, they still aren't very good. I haven't played L.A. Noir, but I know that despite its incredible technical efforts to record persuasive, dramatic performances with high-definition 3D scans, the game never mechanically gave you consistent tells on when a witness was or wasn't lying or was holding back information. Eventually, interrogations would boil down to guessing and testing until you eventually get it right. There was no way to project your own experience of human nature onto these situations because they were all fictional. Human revolution is the same way. Without understanding the motivations behind these people, trying to be either sympathetic or empathetic or aggressive is a crapshoot. Let me put it another way. Have you ever worked in the service industry, you know, retail or in a call center? Did you ever have to do role plays in a training environment, which are the worst ways to train you ever? You're cast as the employee while the other person acts as a customer, but they're not an authentic customer, they're just another employee trying to evaluate your sales pitch with their own biases. They're trying to observe your method, make sure you're hitting arbitrary milestones in your pitch, and maybe even trip you up for practice or spite. That's what feeling out these mini-bosses' intentions is like, because they're fictional. You're not sizing up real people here, which makes deciphering emotional nuance useless. To try and dodge the whole issue, there's the social enhancement augmentation, which is essentially a teacher's workbook assistant for these mini-boss conversations. I added it pretty early on because I love bumping my persuasion stat wherever I can in role-playing games. Game Maker's Toolkit has a really good video about how games allow you to talk your way out of shootouts, and of course Human Revolution was a big example. They point out, rightfully so, that the social enhancer spells out everything about a character because figuring them out through subtext or background information is essentially impossible. When you enter into these conversations, you've had little to no setup with these characters whatsoever. Despite all the emails and extracurricular literature that this game has, nothing tips you off on why or how different mini bosses will behave the way they do. Game Maker's Toolkit offers good solutions, and I've linked that video in the description below. The social enhancer spells out the character's motivations, but it also adds in this very strange pairing of persuasion and personality meters. I only ever tilted the persuasion meter to the red once, so it didn't seem particularly useful, or I was just pretty good at this, but the personality meter was odd. First off, it's always on the screen usually covering up the other person's face, so that's annoying. I wish the UX person had figured that out. As people speak, the personality meter will sometimes light up in one of the three personality buckets. At predetermined stages of the conversation, you can release a pheromone that appeals to the target based on their personality type. Unfortunately, this is a very weird mechanic because the meter rarely ever lights up. It usually just sits there, vacant. Sometimes it'll dump values into a couple buckets, which can make choosing any particular personality type a gamble. If you do manage to choose the proper personality type, your pheromone push will cause a swing in the conversation in your favor that can feel awfully comical, especially as the drama of these conversations escalates. You can be three, four, five rows in with the target, and all you have to do is pick the right reaction, and they will instantly change their mind, even as they've been passionately debating with you up to that point, to the extent that maybe even you believe what they're saying. It's so ridiculous that even Malik warns you against using the social enhancer on her. Malik. Jensen, if you even think of using that Casey mod on me, I will hit you. I wouldn't dream of it. Human Revolution's dialogue system seems so strange because it's the most complex system to emulate. 
Bullets projecting through brains is easy. Hiding outside of an enemy's cone of vision in clearly defined cover is easy. Building a tactical minigame with clearly defined win and lose states is easy. Emulating persuasive social interaction between fictional characters, even with the best writing in the world, that's not so easy. I don't blame Montreal for the social pillar not being as sturdy as the others. They did what they could. But I think Ion Storm was more believable by making conversations more direct, more informational, and more about providing a narrative backbone rather than presenting virtual characters with complex motivations. We know their motivations are complex through their actions, not merely because of their argumentative rhetoric. The original game's characters are far more memorable because they have clearly defined unambiguous agendas that sometimes come across as cartoonish. Portraying uninteresting characters with ambiguity does not make them more interesting. It makes interacting with them less interesting. That's the high concept card that Human Revolution tries to play, and it really doesn't work, especially as it endlessly builds out its roster. Ah yes, the time is finally here. The boss battles of this game stand philosophically against everything the game, nay, nay, the entire series, has taught you up to this point about being able to play how you want by forcing you to defeat bullet spongy bosses in arenas in very specific ways very specific combat-oriented ways. Like, could you imagine playing Hades, in which you could, like, sneak by every single enemy, and then you still had to do the boss battles? Like, that'd be weird. However you may have played before these encounters, however you may have specced your Jensen, may be entirely irrelevant once you entered into these confrontations. The reason why these boss battles don't fit into the scheme of this game is that they were outsourced to another Montreal-based developer. Grip Entertainment, when the main team was running out of time and resources trying to get the game out the door. Eidos Montreal built the story around defeating these opponents, but didn't design how you actually accomplished this. The Ion Storm games had boss battles as well, but they were more subdued affairs that didn't rattle the pace of the game or force you into playing it specific ways. There are four of these bosses in the original game with a fifth added in The Missing Link that are designed to serve as chapter bookends, except not really. The first three bosses are the high-powered mercenaries who raid Seraph's labs in the game's opening moments, while the final boss, Zhao, is... well, I'll explain that. And then there's Burke in the DLC, which is self-contained. These battles remind me a lot of Remedy boss battles. Actually, especially in their latter-day games like Quantum Break or Alan Wake, in that you may be used to using one or two mechanics at a time to complete objectives that require one or two mechanics simultaneously, but when the boss shows up with a buffet of abilities, you're forced to micromanage all of your attacks and abilities in a way that the game hasn't required before. Additionally, there's a time pressure, so sitting still to regroup for far too long is fatal. It makes these conflicts counterintuitive unless you're a fast all-combat player. These arenas are loaded with weapons and ammunition for little reason other than the bosses or bullet sponges. If you're quick, you can grab them without getting injured by the boss, then manage them into your inventory so you can use them properly. Sometimes you get to use the environments against bosses, like hacking these turrets to attack Federova in Montreal, or these ones to attack Barrett. Oh, if only I had the skills to do that. Here comes the new game plus playthrough. If you're the stealthy type who likes to hide until you have the best moment to strike, you'll find that you are constantly squeezed out of any advantage you have, like a terrible version of Hungry Hungry Hippos. With the director's cut, Montreal said that they revisited these boss battles, and I was very underwhelmed with their results. It seems they just augmented these arenas so that hackers or stealth players had better options to beat these opponents. It really just meant I had spaces to crawl into to cheese these bosses in new ways. I finished Barrett by luring him into a corner and then shotgunning him in the head from above until he died. The amount of damage these bosses take is the most discouraging, especially since they have no health bar and no alternate speech bites to indicate your progress. Once I got into a rhythm with the third mercenary, Joran, I was hopping from one end of the arena to the other, bumping off two shotgun blasts before he could discharge his fatal plasma charges and dropping any occasional mine. The thing is, this encounter went back and forth so long that I thought he was recharging his health between strikes because the game never telegraphed that I was actually accomplishing anything until he finally fell dead. 
For all of the base game's bosses, even with the director's cut edits, I had to enlist Google to figure out how to defeat them when the arenas weren't very clear about what they offered, and the boss rarely offered you time to investigate. The three mercenaries took about 45 minutes each to beat through countless deaths and lots of popping off small bits of damage before running off and waiting to do it again. With Burke, the Missing Link DLC simply sets up an arena with the boss on the far end elevated away. Burke, Montreal explains, is how they would have built boss battles had they designed them in the first place. It puts the onus on the player to figure out how to defeat the boss with knowledge and skills they built on their own. Irritatingly, they didn't try to make any of the battles against the original bosses like this for the director's cut, despite having a year and a half to do it. It took little effort to sneak past Burke's troops, blow up the door protecting him with my shotgun, knock him down with a concussion grenade while I reloaded, then march in and finish him off quickly. By my count, even with the multiple attempts, this only took about 7 minutes to do, and was substantially more interesting, fun, and delightful than all the other fights combined. The final fight with Tai Young Medical CEO Zhao on Panchea is a strange beast. It was short, but probably because my skills let me easily hack through the arenas to terminals and press two buttons while my EMP shielding ensured that I didn't take damage from the rotating electrical fields. The game didn't present any other audio or video cues about what to do next, so uh, uh, I sat there a bit. Eventually I decided to shoot at Zhao, who I thought was already dead based on this earlier cutscene where Jensen literally shoots her in the chest and, and then it ended. I was kind of happy the fight went so quick considering my struggles with the others and how close I was to the conclusion. And then there's the matter of purity, sophistication, and craft. I don't know how big this group is anymore, but there exists a portion of the audience, a cadre of fans of the original game, who believe that everything after the game's 2000 release was watered down because they were built with the console in mind. And the console gamer, of course, can't truly appreciate games with lofty ambitions because they don't have a full keyboard and mouse. They can't appreciate the games because until 2009, most households still only played at 640 by 480 standard definition resolution because they didn't have high definition televisions yet to lay out fast, informative interfaces. I place this here because it's obviously a gripe about gameplay and mechanics, since the graphics clearly got better. It begs a variety of questions about the intentions of the design choices of both games, 11 years and a very different industry apart. Of course, this is all a matter of perspective. It might be a spoiler, but of these four games, I still hail the original game as the best of the series, and a lot of that comes from the fact that it was the first to be a Deus Ex game, and every other Deus Ex game had to deal with being an extension of what already existed. There are those who hail each and every facet of the original game as high art, while being more lenient in ignoring its many clunky mechanics. They also forget that the game made it over to the PlayStation 2 almost entirely unchanged, except for some limitations here and there like getting the controls to work on a DualShock 2, or getting the UX to work on tube TVs in standard definition resolution, or the smaller chunked up levels thanks to the smaller amount of memory. And still, the original Deus Ex is still on the PlayStation 2 of all consoles. When Invisible War implemented a universal ammo system, nuked its inventory system in favor of the simplified retinal interface, or had you wandering through levels the size of shoeboxes, an experience the fans would receive the following year, that definitely felt like a game being dumbed down for the unsophisticated. But not unsophisticated players, unsophisticated execs at IDOS who pulled pretty much all of the strings. I mean, yes, Invisible War looked better technically, and the intro was a lot sharper, but everything else felt regressive. Invisible War is watered down compared to Deus Ex, absolutely, but Human Revolution? That's a far more complex question. Throughout this review so far, I've pointed out moments where Human Revolution traded out an old mechanic for something new or different, and I've appreciated it. All of the new mechanics they bring to the table, a number that actually makes the original game look spartan in comparison, don't always work great, but they work. With Human Revolution, Montreal proves again that consoles don't inherently make a game less sophisticated. 
Removing the clunky and unnecessary skill system of Deus Ex doesn't make it less sophisticated, it makes it more elegant, which carries its own sophistication. There are going to be people arguing brass tacks until Kingdom Come about auto-saving checkpoints, mouse-driven menus, and spray-and-pray blind firing. But what they won't be arguing about is how clicking through two more menus to find a key code for a door is somehow more ambitious and rewarding than the game automatically prompting the right code or password at the relevant door or terminal terminal if you've already uncovered the information, or having to track down specific canisters and install them with a specific tool in the game makes augmentations more substantial. Human Revolution is a much bigger, much longer, much more mechanically sophisticated game than the original in every way, even if it reduces the number of steps for several intrinsic processes and introduces things like cover that only awkwardly existed before. In the areas where Human Revolution's gameplay pales compared to the original is because, well, philosophically, Montreal wanted to make a different game. Having said all of these things about the mechanics and gameplay of Deus Ex Human Revolution, many of which directly transfer to its sequel, positive and negative, there's something philosophical that this game misses out on, and that's the actual simulation in Immersive Sim, or Emergent Gameplay. An immersive sim doesn't actually need to have complex simulated systems, like a Bethesda RPG or even a Far Cry game does. Deus Ex skirted this by over-designing every level and interaction to create this vast illusion that you are affecting and changing the world in huge ways by doing small things like adding half sentences of dialogue here and there based on your previous actions. There are large technical reasons why the game couldn't handle large dynamic worlds in 2000. And while Deus Ex dreamt of full-on dynamic simulation, Human Revolution seems to ignore it altogether. In this game, you will rarely encounter moments of serendipitous consequence. Things will rarely cascade or chain react. When feeling mischievous in Hengshaw, I never felt like I could pull off the kind of domino action that would happen if I broke into a storefront in the original game's Hong Kong. Just like I mentioned earlier about how activities and their consequences in the game rarely extend beyond the short term, there are no massive clockwork mechanics forcing you to think on your feet. Everything feels preordained and established with little maneuverability, which goes hand in hand with the limited, somewhat claustrophobic level designs, the squandered side quests, or the lack of dialogue socketing that reflects previous actions. Aside from the physics, there never feels like there's anything going on under the hood that dynamically affects anyone else outside of the game's overwritten plot points. It never feels like there are systems happening outside of the dungeons, and then not often. It's not that Human Revolution doesn't offer choices, or things you won't see without a second or third playthrough, but the notion that Warren Spector once put forward that each player will have some unique Dungeons and Dragons-esque experience to regale their friends with never seems to happen in here. Everyone seems to hit the same rigid milestones in this game regardless of how they played, and how they play each encounter never feels radically different or worthy of the digital campfire. The content I didn't see on my now two playthroughs isn't enticing me to play through it again to find it. But then we come to the actual story of Human Revolution, warts and all. We may be looking at serious cross-systemic failure issues with the OCM. It's those god-awful implants, Gary. The whole inhumane procedure. After a while, it just burns them out. Empowered by their much bigger budget, longer development time, and bigger team, Eidos Montreal bit off a whole lot in establishing this prequel universe. And it is enormous. They didn't just create a cyberpunk tale, they set up an entire playground for so, so many different stories to be told. This world of 2027 feels so big and busy. The set pieces are incredible. The production is nuts, and the amount of places you can go and things you can do is superlative after superlative. If the original game was the only installment in the series, it would work as a self-contained game, and in the imagination of the purists, it still is. But Deus Ex feels like a glinting quartz crystal in this massive geode of a universe that Human Revolution creates. While the scale of this game has its perks, it also becomes a liability when crafting a story to tie it all together. The fact that this is yet another tale of a Deus Ex protagonist growing from security expert to world shaper feels kind of absurd at this point, as if that arc is the only way they could make a satisfying story with so many moving parts and characters, as if there's no reason to tweak what worked a decade prior. 
Human Revolution doesn't quite pull it off, and I'm glad that Mankind Divided switches tactics. I remember playing this right at release and marveling at how unnecessarily convoluted the story was. I was reminded yet again when playing its sequel, which includes an edited recap video of this game's story, and watching it as it just goes and goes and goes, not remembering like hardly any of its story beats. The recap highlighted how it would set up a new character to present the next twist in the plot, and then immediately forget they existed, leading to a massive cast of characters that you don't really care about and don't get any development out of. And then here I was, playing this again for the second time all the way through, with an intent to see as much of this content as possible, and I was still shocked at how needlessly busy the story is. It's clear that they eventually exercised restraint at some points, like in how they largely excised the Icarus allegory they were gunning for before release, saving that largely for subtext and scattered references. This narrative gets in the game's way so much, so often, that you have to sometimes lean on the load screen narrative tooltips to keep track of what's going on. Unfortunately, technology is so fast now that you aren't going to be able to read these before the levels load. Maybe if they had included a press A to start game thing, I think that could have worked as well. But why? And how? The Ion Storm games had complex plots with big casts, sure. Human Revolution's narrative is built on the exploits of leaders laid out in this kind of three-dimensional mesh. Who is pro-Og and who's anti-Og? Are they pro or anti-Og for monetary or humanitarian reasons? Who is for and against the Illuminati, an entity that's hinted at but not actually addressed until Mankind Divided. There are so, so many factions and groups to keep track of that they're rarely more than confusing. By comparison, the first game has Unaco and then the NSF. It's simple and effective, like the rebels fending off the evil empire in Star Wars. It paints the side you're on as the good side and the people you're fighting as the bad side, before slowly picking away at the whole notion. As the facade falls away, the game gives you enough information to pick between them, setting up what I think is a successful, if rather brief, finale where you basically sign on the dotted line that this is what you agree with. Deus Ex doesn't have an issue introducing challenges and twists while making sure you still understand what's going on. And I'm not saying that the original game's way of doing things is the only way it could have been done, but it certainly did it more effectively. Human Revolution's interplay of factions, characters, and ideas could only work out if it weren't so convoluted, and in far too many cases, inconsequential. Here's a big example. Many of the game's side quests in particular boil down to police procedural style missions where you track down evidence and solve crimes, especially early on in Detroit. One in particular has you meeting a longtime accomplice who spins you out on a quest to investigate a crooked cop. The crooked cop, it turns out, wants to start a gang war. The thing is, none of this is interesting, or even relevant to what you're trying to do in the game. I realize your role as Seraph Security Chief involves some detective work, but uh, not like this. Hearing more about my long-term accomplice would have actually been cool. Having the game flesh out these two gangs, or who leads them, or what the stakes are would have been cool. But none of these things happen. Instead, you're plundering the most mundane urban environments for clues, largely just by following arrows on the map. The game squanders so much time that could have been spent building up the world and its characters in favor of these boring quests that don't add anything. There are so many needlessly long quest chains, and while logging the footage for this review, I kept wondering, why am I doing this? Side quests are optional, but they represent a considerable chunk of the game's content and rarely feel more than larded on. Making things more complicated, the game doesn't want to explain stuff, particularly in support of the main quest. Again, the original games kept things enigmatic to build the suspense and maintain high dramatic stakes. This newer game features a lot more dialogue and presents far more characters that want you invested emotionally in their struggles, but then doesn't present the case. Far too often, Human Revolution feels like watching mid-tier network science fiction. In a way, Human Revolution is the anti-outer worlds of world building, a game where every character will vomit out a detailed history of everything if you dive in just slightly into their conversations, something that made the dialogue system in that game very fatiguing. Here, there are times where you actually want to know more about 
about this world, its characters, the organizations, and so forth, but the game has little to tell you. The game provides glimpses from a top level, while characters are cryptic and dodgy at best. You can't just talk to Hugh Darrow about what the hell he's about the first time you meet him in person, which would provide you some vital persuasion tools when you talk to him later. Details are littered throughout the world in newspapers and emails, or buried in specific conversations based on what's going on at the moment. Even if you manage to scrap together that information, you'll still have questions that can only be answered by checking out external sites that have had years to compile all the information that wasn't made explicitly available in the game's deepest corners. Fandom's footnotes reveal that you have to engage in the game's other transmedia content, like novels and comic books, to get anywhere near a satisfying grasp of the story or its characters. What about Adam Jensen's childhood? Early on, Seraph can send you an email chain about an investigation he launched about that very thing that skims the details of what you would want out of an investigation of your childhood. And then you can meet this lady who worked at the labs you were born at, a thread that ends before it becomes interesting, coming nearly three quarters of the way through the game. Sometimes events in the story foreshadow and let you feel out the vague shape of what's going to happen and you can't quite put your thumb on what it is until it happens. And when the game pulls this off, it's a tremendous success, but it's a rare thing. And there's one more thing. Quests and dialogue altogether feel overwritten. Like the game had far more writing talent on hand than they needed. There were so many moments playing this game where I stopped and thought, People don't actually talk like this. People don't actually use these words. Nearly everyone seems to speak at a high school or collegiate level, and it really makes relating to them and the things they want or need difficult. Meanwhile, I'll lament about the end of the civilized world as we know it. Right off the bat, Human Revolution introduces you to Adam Jensen, the anchor goateed security chief with the gravelly voice. Adam is supposed to be the ultra cool guy you'd buy an articulated model of. He kind of has a personality and a history. He's an ex-cop who spends the first hour of the game back at Seraph HQ dispelling myths about what happened to him on the police force. He wasn't fired from the police force, he quit. The game's behind the scenes footage provides background, but it seems a little strange that the game just doesn't explain it itself. Maybe if I'd read more emails or talked to more people I could have figured this out on my own, but I don't think so. He displays an open anger and distrust of the Pikus News Network that's in spreading misinformation about him. And not just about him, because it's become the de facto source of information in this universe. We'll come back to this. Over the course of the game, it's revealed that your former co-workers on the police force are emotionally unstable individuals. You get to experience them operating at full tilt as they demonstrate a lack of any specific abilities to keep cool. I don't know if this is supposed to be the game saying something about the average police officer's ability to do their job under stress, or that cops are just naturally piping hot under their collars. Either way, it leads me to believe that Adam got out of a bad situation by leaving the force and the testosterone SWAT jockeys you meet at Milwaukee Junction don't help the image. Adam comes across as a duty-bound individual, a non-specific male example of a role model who presses on regardless. I'll have plenty to say about his girlfriend, Dr. Megan Reed, later, but he's played as a bit of a loner, a guy who doesn't hang out with co-workers after hours and lives alone in his sparsely furnished apartment. He's a blank character with a personality waxed on, as opposed to the Dentons of previous games that were just blank characters. He's supposed to be a badass John McClane-style hero, but without any of the humor. Adam is not a funny guy, and he isn't even written funny ironically, nor is anything else in this game, which feels like a lost opportunity for even the ironic humor that JC could pull off. Oh my god, JC, a bomb! A bomb. Not only does this lack of emotional variety make him seem wooden, it also makes it harder to relate to him. And like JC, it makes moments where you're trying to play the far ends of the charitable slash jackass spectrum feel inert. As though you have to project however good or bad you feel about your actions as Adam onto Adam. As the security chief for Seraph Industries, it would appear you have some responsibilities. In the opening cutscene, Jensen coordinates details for your failed trip to Washington, D.C., and throughout the game, as you talk to co-workers, they keep referring to you and your team, or 
your people in regards to things that happen off screen or in the past. Despite this promising dimension, you don't ever command security forces, except when you hack into security terminals. You don't have a team interface to lead people around, you have no persistent crew around you. You don't dictate policies. You barely even discuss it with your boss. It's superficial. It's even kind of weird that you respond to the lab attacks in the tutorial alone, as though you are the only security person who actually works at Seraph. Would it have been difficult to implement Tom Clancy's gameplay with a team? Absolutely, but like, what if? What if Adam Jensen had the power to pull rank and lead people around instead of all of his power being another layer of costuming? When we meet JC, it is literally his first day on the job, so Jensen commands these extra expectations. But maybe playing in this world that's so much fuller raised expectations for me on what to expect out of Adam and his occupation. Likewise, your posse is underwhelming. In previous games, you had a group of people that you're regularly in touch with that help the narrative along, but also don't make you feel so lonely in your world-changing questline. As you make your way back to Yanatko HQ over and over, you build relationships with nearly all of your co-workers, either in person or via email or over the chatterbox. I know it's just a form of capitalist control to say that your co-workers are like a family, but whether it's your Dr. Jaime, or your comm specialist Alex, your wise uncle Sam, or Manderley's assistant, it really does feel like these people want you to succeed. Likewise, you want them to succeed too. Something Here you have no such family despite working in such a big company with so many employees and people to talk to. Your pilot rests on one shoulder and Seraph's tech admin Pritchard perches on the other, and that's it. Every other co-worker is just world fill. Malik is friendly enough, she even presents a side quest at a point, which gives her more personality than even your boss, David Seraph. And unfortunately, she's gone three quarters of the way through if you're not quick or armed enough. It's not like you can prevent her death entirely jock style, and when you can't, it's genuinely creepy to find her body later on. It's also weird that she relays information from other people, even if those people could just message you themselves. Hey, I got a message for you, Jensen, from Pritchard. He says he's not in the office. Pritchard is antagonistic, but he's not a rival. He never actually works against you, despite how cruel he can be in your first few conversations. He has this kind of arc, where it seems he genuinely cares about your exploits, especially as the stakes escalate. I wish the game did more with them. I've mentioned the September 2000 PC Gamer review of the original game before, and I wish I had a scan or a copy of it with me, but in single-handedly convinced me to buy it. It described a game in which actions you take early on in the game affect things later on. I talk about this in my Deus Ex review when I reach Area 51, but I was very inspired by this notion of real conspiracies and severe consequences taglines on the box. I don't think the original game pulled it off the way my imagination imagined it would for mechanical and technical reasons, but I think it effectively creates an illusion that what you're doing in Unatco HQ affects what happens in, say, Vandenberg. It plays a lot of long games, like I mentioned earlier, like when Jock died on my first playthrough. I was completely clueless about the circumstances that led to it. Human Revolution rarely ever creates this narrative of illusion, despite having substantially more tools and resources to do it than Ion Storm had. In Human Revolution, the only consequences you experience for your actions typically happen within about a 60 minute window of when it happens. Which is basically no time at all considering this is a game that took me nearly 35 hours to complete. There's rarely a moment in this game that feels influenced by something you did hours or dozens of hours ago. This game really feels like you're on a highly produced roller coaster, and any choices you have reflect on how you play it moment to moment, like how much ammo you have on hand, or how many praxis points or dollars I scraped, rather than some story beat that will be changed later on. There was one exception, and that was when I convinced my old cop co-worker Haas to let me through the police department without issue. Somehow, I did something, and when I returned to Detroit hours and hours later, he was waiting in my apartment's lobby to shoot me dead. It felt like the game's lone attempt to demonstrate this ability to tie past and present, but when it happened, I genuinely couldn't remember him. I literally had to pause the game and Google him to remember why this guy was trying to kill me while I was in the headspace to deal with something else. I wish the game did this a lot more often and not just to increase the number of instances of it happening, but philosophically make it essential to the design of the game. 
And the thing is, the original game, a much simpler game, did things like this over and over again, reminding you often about the power of its narrative tools. So, the story. Explaining Human Revolution's story note for note is a fool's errand and a slog, because if I didn't care about it when it happened, why would I care about scripting it out, recording it, finding the footage, and placing it in this video? I want you to make it to the end of this video, guys, but also, honestly, I think the story has a lot of interesting ideas, but, well, we'll get to that. Okay, so a lot of this you already understand. You're Adam Jensen, your girlfriend is Dr. Megan Reed, and you're about to go to Washington, D.C. to present her research, which is about to reveal that Seraph Industries now has a way to become augmented without regular doses of neuropazine, you know, that drug controlled by private companies to control the augmented. And then right as we brief your boss, David Seraph, the name on the building, mercenaries infiltrate and attack the labs and kill key scientists involved with the discovery. Or do they? While leaving you for dead, and you obviously didn't ask for this. Six months later, you were called to duty for Seraph before you were even ready to solve another attack on another Seraph facility. You get it, this is the tutorial we were talking about earlier. The arc of the story is relatively simple. It begins with the attack on Seraph, with the first half focused on tracking down the three mercenaries who committed it while establishing the global power players. This is where the story drags the most, trying to explain a lot through this unnecessarily convoluted thread involving this hacker who kills himself, who's part of an anti-aug terrorist movement, and blah blah blah. This takes hours to resolve, and it's barely more compelling than a Law & Order episode. The first half introduces you to a whole bunch of characters, but wastes your valuable hub time on some very unexciting side quests. At the halfway point, you discover that the scientists weren't killed in the Seraph lab attacks. They were kidnapped, and their GPL tracking chips were muted by Eliza Kassan and Picus News. So after a trip to Montreal, the second half involves tracking down the scientists, a big globe-trotting funnel that involves finding and saving those scientists, including Dr. Megan Reed, and then a final showdown in the end to wrap things up. And amongst all this is the missing link. Yeah, you don't ever you get to really Tiger know or understand your boss, lab, but he comes across more, as an inauthentic in. salesman. Not really helped by the fact that he conceals so much about so you, your yeah, job, the things you're doing, or the things he's done, or that he sounds like Will Forte, who I thought a decade ago was his voice actor. Seraph is pure capitalist, and his neuropazine free augmentations are going to make him a lot of money. As we eventually find out, the attack on his labs is perpetuated by the Illuminati, who don't want his revelation to come to market or they'll lose some of their grasp on global society. The Detroit hub is an interesting place to prod and explore, and while I mentioned the barely illustrated gangs before, I'm reminded of how successfully the original game presented the triads of Hong Kong and highlighted how they functioned and why they fought each other. This game doesn't do that, and it would have led to much more interesting quests here. As you advance down the Golden Path, you end up at a remote warehouse district dungeon that's really a shroud for a secret FEMA lab with a dramatic elevator sequence. And as you arrive, you realize that the AI does not care that an elevator car just showed up and no one was in it. And there's a giant robot. I died a lot. You kill Barrett after working through this repetitive dungeon who points you to Hengshaw right before he explodes. Hengshaw is also a beautiful hub. Lots to see, even if aesthetically it really isn't that much different than the bloomy murk of Detroit after the eyes adjust. Which is disappointing. What is cool, however, is starting out on the lower deck, aka the ground level, and peering up at the upper deck, and it's probably the most imaginative skybox in any Deus Ex game. There are lots of fun little dramas here, and I honestly like the side quests here over Detroit, primarily because it doesn't try to set up so many things that won't ultimately pay off. There's a tong here that you are led to believe is related to the tracer tong we know and love from the sequels, but if you're playing the base game, it amounts to little more than a teaser. But the specific nugget of DLC that comes with this director's cut, you do actually get to rescue tracer, and then it just feels like fan service. But that doesn't happen now, it happens later. You're here to find the Dutchman who has information you want up in Taeyong Medical Tower, the centerpiece of the upper deck. So you make your way through the Pangu, which the game thankfully does not explain at all, and then up into the tower where you discover that the scientists are alive thanks to a tiny little info dump by Zhao that the Dutchman found in surveillance footage. After a series of beautiful elevator rides and corporate hustling, you confront Zhao, who, just a reminder, is the CEO of Taeyong Medical Group. 
a whole bunch of people show up happy to see you and you need to disable some big robots before Malik can land and you can inform her that you're both headed to Montreal. So we're here in Montreal at PNN. <laughs> okay, that was kind of funny. We're here to confront Picus, and by Picus, who is not a person, we're here to confront Picus newswoman and presenter Eliza Kassan, who is also not a person, but an AI. The top of this dungeon is just empty news pits to fight through, and then you take a funicular, which is a funicular word to say, to the Illuminati-themed basement where you encounter the super AI Eliza and defeat the second mercenary, Fedorova, the geometry woman. Anyway, after another very stupid boss battle that I remember took way longer this time than a decade ago, you realize that Eliza isn't just an AI-generated news presence on television calibrated for our enjoyment, but an actual sentient artificial intelligence that's the result of this massive server farm. Eliza is a tool, but who wields her? The Illuminati, of course. So it makes sense that Picus would help the mercenaries jam the Seraph scientist GPL signals and prevent them from being tracked because the CEO of Picus Montreal is Morgan Everett, who we discover in emails we can find. Everett is part of the Illuminati, and the Illuminati ordered the hit squad on Seraph in the first place. And piecing this together only makes sense in retrospect, and I have no idea how anyone could have figured this out without having played the original game or the sequel Mankind Divided. Or by reading fandom. I mean, yeah, there's also the Illuminati Ball and the Grasping Hand statue and the triangles, but... Let's start a riot, because Anti-Og leader Taggart is here, and he's here about Anti-Og stuff. And there are protesters and police in the streets changing up the mood. And that's cool. There are street preachers out for and against augmentation, and the main quest takes you into the Detroit Convention Center. For some reason, I didn't get to chat with Taggart like I did a decade ago. Instead, I got information from his assistant's computer, who isn't there, but is hiding in this very secret sewer base. While trying to find the entrance to this very secret sewer base, I didn't realize I'd killed Zeke Sanders, the guy who was holding up the Milwaukee Junction, until I was logging footage and the game doesn't seem to care about it at all. But maybe it's not him. I don't know how many people in this game have an eye patch, but I don't think it's more than one. Taggart's assistant Sandoval wants to end his life, but with two sentences, he suddenly doesn't. If this all seems confusing, don't worry, it is. You go to meet your boss, but Hugh Darrow is there for some reason, and Seraph sends you off to Hengshaw again because they found one of the GPLs there based on your intel. Oh, and, and Hugh Darrow, the creator of all modern augmentation technology as we know it, he and Seraph are obviously buddy-buddy in this whole augmentation business thing. Too bad you don't get to learn much about him beyond random emails and books you find throughout the game. Bell Tower, which is a private military outfit managed secretly by the Illuminati, shoots down our, um, plane and Malik dies, or doesn't. But Jensen doesn't seem shaken up about it at all, like, at all not in the slightest, does not express any sadness or emotional backlash to this at all. I forgot to mention that starting in Detroit, your UI is starting to have these little optical glitches, and Pritchard, whose first name really should be Richard instead of Frank, informs you that you can go to the local limb clinic for a new biochip to fix the issue. And who boy is there a line, but you flash your badge and get right in. I know that the biochip is a bad deal because I've played this game before, but it was opposite day again, and I wanted to see what would happen if I got it, so I did. Also, Hugh Darrow reaches out to you for one tiny side quest to non-lethally retrieve a biochip from a street gang hanging out in a bad spot. And then that's it. Odd. Uh, thanks. You find the GPL for Seraph's Dr. Sevchenko, the guy from the tutorial Walk and Talk, attached to Tong's dad from earlier. Ouch. Tung tells you you need to smuggle above this ship after blowing up the admin offices to find the other Seraph scientists. Oh, and bye Tracer, see you in 25 years. So this is the point where the base game would just send you to Singapore, but the missing link kicks in here. You wake up, or are woken up, by Bell Tower jackasses for the six hour detour on a ship constructed entirely of tightly packed hallways and spaces. Something that would be gamified to become the breach mode of Mankind Divided. As Kirk Hamilton put it in his review of this DLC for Kotaku, as a result of the closed nature of the story, there are so many possible solutions offered to every problem that things somehow feel false, almost like Jensen has been inserted into a Deus Ex simulator. An unknown, enigmatic voice, an absolute unit of this series, helps you off this ship and through the Bell Tower black site you dock at. When the story does finally pick up hours in, you begin to understand, to some extent, what's going on here with a cameo by Gary Savage from the original game. 
Of course, this is all pretty much for naught, because every character who's introduced in this chapter is gone before you leave, or never referenced again. The outro cinematic involves your then-unmasked helper chatting with yet another enigmatic helper, having vague conversations about the fate of Jensen. It's a decent slice of game, but criminy does it add little more than hours to your play count. We pick up where the original game had you going from Hengsha, a research lab in Singapore. This is a rather broad dungeon section in which you find and coordinate with the three other Seraph scientists to create a diversion so that you can reach the fourth scientist, Dr. Megan Reed. Before you can find her, however, you need to confront Zhao again, which is really just a setup for your boss battle with anatomical study Jaren. Since I opted to get the biochip replacement at the limb clinic in Hengsha earlier, Zhao causes my augmentations to go haywire and useless during this fight, which is not a fun fight because none of them are. We've already talked about this. And then we're granted access to Dr. Megan Reed, who resides in a monochrome room, perhaps the most beautiful room in this entire game. But before we go into how beautiful this room is, I have to talk about something, primarily, love. Deus Ex is an exciting series. It probes happiness and fear and tension and a bunch of other emotions, if only in a superficial sense sometimes. But I tell you what, it's never explored love before. And how do I know this? Not because I've played every Deus Ex game, and none of them have had even the slightest ambitions of making you relate romantically with any other character, or by portraying romance between any two characters. Heavens no. Heavens no. Human Revolution wanted to tackle this in a meaningful way by establishing a real romantic relationship between your player protagonist and their partner. And the game proceeds to fuck it up entirely. Let's bring up that game timeline again. The first half of the game, after the initial attack, is you trying to track down the mercenaries, but it's really you mourning the loss of your partner, and Adam bats away any character wanting to reference their relationship. When you reach the halfway point and discover she's potentially alive, the second half of the game becomes a spirited dash to reunite with her. But this all rings hollow because, like, how close were you guys really? Look. Every relationship is different. Some are warmer or colder than others. Everyone has different love languages and expresses their affections in different ways. Which is all very understandable considering Adam Jensen and Dr. Megan Reed are co-workers in the highest echelons of Seraph's company. But if these two were lovers and had vulnerable moments that fuel Jensen's romantic crusade that serves as the emotional backbone of the entire game, I, uh, I find that a pretty hard to believe. Through the game you come to know that they lived separately, that they had a dog together that had to be put down because no one knew if either one would survive the initial attack, and in the opening cutscene graphically showing Adam being augmented, there are cutaways showing Adam and Megan being intimate. It's the only time in the entire game that either of them says I love you, and she says it, not him. Adam meets her mother just outside Seraph HQ toward the beginning of the game, and there's no affection there either. There's no emotional connection between these two, despite the fact that you've known her and her daughter for a decade at this point. Cassandra Reed only exists to prompt a mission about the investigation around Megan's disappearance, which just kind of fizzles into nothing. The entire thread involving Megan Reed is a testament to the fact that love does not exist in Deus Ex. It is only cold, calculating action and intrigue. Familial bonds do not exist. Friendship is just a collection of friendly actions and positive attitudes. Your parents are merely reproductive mechanisms, which is why you play orphans in this series. There is no affection in this universe. When Adam finally reunites with Megan, they don't hug or embrace or even display the smallest note of affection, although she does hold his hand before he yanks it away. They are immediately business. She immediately dives into figuring out his corrupt biochip. They rush around the room to set up the final act of the game. The game is obfuscated the entire time that it's Adam Jensen's DNA that Seraph's neuropazine free future rests on, and it conveniently dodges away from explaining it. It's the reason why Megan recommended Adam Jensen for the security chief position after he left his job on the force, so that they could continue to have access to his DNA. It's probably the reason why Seraph augmented him so that Adam wouldn't die, which actually doesn't make any sense now that I think about it, because Seraph has spent the entire game so far sending Adam into extremely dangerous situations around the world. These two do not express themselves affectionately in the slightest. 
Adam explains bluntly as the story points them in separate directions that You and I aren't done with this, Megan. But the response is very clearly, this is not what it seems. I wasn't trying to help the bad guys. I'll explain more later. And when is that later? Never. Never ever. Aside from a post-credits voiceover, in which Megan is impressed by Bob Page's protovirus that hints at the Grey Death from the original game, that's it. She's not in Mankind Divided at all, and since we'll never get the third game of this Adam Jensen trilogy, that means that all of the romantic build-up in this game was for literally nothing. There is no payoff. There is no relationship. Dr. Megan Reed is barely a character, much less a lover. She's a damsel in distress, a narrative object to move the plot along barely more than a MacGuffin. So, it's so sad because she deserved so much better and so did we. <sighs> so you get through all that and hop on the LEO shuttle headed to Panchea. While you are hanging out with the love of your entire life, a live broadcast reveals that Hugh Darrow, a figure you know basically nothing about, has slipped a script and used the new biochips that everyone got alongside an over-the-air update to turn all augmented people into raging psychotic monsters. This would become known as the Aug Incident in the second game that divides mankind. <clears throat> because you know. Panchea is a very, very fascinating structure and I wanted to know more about it. It's Hugh Darrow's geoengineering project in the Arctic Ocean designed to end global warming, and I guess it's supposed to be a hole all the way down to the ocean floor? I went researching how this giant hole in the earth is supposed to work, and the only thing I found was entirely unexciting techno babble about iron and shit. So I'm just gonna conject that the atmosphere is just supposed to drop all its naughty CO2 stuff into this giant well, and we win the end. As a level, Panchea is Human Revolution's Area 51. Darrow has gathered the leaders of all the game's major factions here, and they are now isolated from each other by groups of raving mad augmented folk that you have to deal with. With the help of the social enhancer, you discover that Darrow flipped rather unconvincingly to destroy what he had spent a lifetime creating because his body would not accept the augmentations that he had created for others. So he decided to take his ball and go home, not realizing that uh, your DNA could probably solve that, maybe. Darrow's twist would have been clever if Taggart had not been painted as the game's anti-augmentation crusader. But when you talk to Taggart, he doesn't even want to eliminate augmentations, he just wants to regulate the things. Finding home in a very unsatisfying middle field as a very unsatisfying character. These Montreal games are full of these just boring suits with mealy mouth agendas that we're supposed to care about because, like a random found stick propping up a car hood, they advance the plot. Ah, but no, it was secretly Darrow who was against augmentations outright. <sighs> cool. Unlike the original game where you're presented a last minute case by each faction to resolve the story in their direction, you only actually need to talk to Darrow here. You can leave Taggart and your boss alone. Of course, none of this makes sense at all. Why would Darrow invite everyone up here to the middle of the Arctic Ocean where he's building his atmospheric toilet, only to trap himself with all of the augmented workers he just made critically insane? What does he get out of it? I mean, we understand why the game's designers wanted all of the factions up here in a tense end stage, but the narrative reasons make no sense. All of this nonsense concludes in a fight with Pancheo's security system, something in the game also only drops hints about, but otherwise just kind of springs it on us whole cloth. And Zhao's here taking control of this thing, and just whatever. I'm sure this fight was supposed to be a lot more dramatic, but it wasn't. And then I was in the final chamber, chatting with Eliza Kassan of all people, who lords over what Yahtzee once affectionately called the Ending Tron 3000 because Eidos Montreal ran out of time, and this is one of the things they felt they could cut corners on. Each of the three buttons represents the three factions upstairs, and by pressing any of these buttons, zing, you're off, and Eliza concocts a different story for the masses based on what you've seen and done up here. At this point, it doesn't really matter what you pick, just make your save point and watch them all. The game's done very little to entice you to join or experience any of these factions individually, so I find it hard to believe that many gamers had one clear loyalty over the others when playing this game and reaching this finale. Pick an ending and you'll get an interesting outro where Jensen philosophizes vaguely about the future course of humanity while being weirdly introspective. One ending might be fine in a vacuum, but you realize in watching all of them that there's so much overlap between these factions and the content of these outro videos that they feel annoyingly similar, even starting out with the same tilt over polar ice. 
Writing this review, I was still curious about how the Illuminati figured into any of this, and what became of the game's various characters, and the game does not provide this satisfaction. Fittingly, in a room off to the side from the ending Tron 3000 lies a fourth ending in which the game, in the cheekiest suggestion, mocks the notion that any single person should be able to shape the future of humanity like Jensen is able to at the end of this game. It's kind of a meta-commentary on human revolution altogether, and I guess I'm a little surprised that they didn't try to augment any of this for the director's cut. They did literally nothing to enhance or elaborate or build on these endings at all. Maybe they didn't want to give away the goat by revealing what they may have had in store with the sequel that they were working on at the time. I don't know. Then the credits roll, and there's this New Game Plus option in your menu, which you may be enticed to dive into if you aren't entirely worn out by the story's arc, and that's that. Do you want to play this game again? I mean, it took me a decade, but I'm just some YouTuber. Answer me, Jensen. Where are you going? Hell if I know, Pritchard. Hell if I know. How hard was it for Eidos Montreal to reboot and prequelize one of the most important video games ever made? Really hard, I'm sure. I don't envy their task in the slightest, years and years later. But how do I feel about Human Revolution a decade later? So now that we're all this way into the review, I think it's safe to say that I can share something uh, with you. Uh, I know I recommended it at the top of the video, but my review for Deus Ex Mankind Divided, the sequel to this game, it's honestly my least favorite review. And if I had the time and ability, I'd redo it. Like, maybe if I hit a thousand supporters on Patreon, I'd, I'll redo it, just saying. Um, but when I was doing the review for this game, I looked back at my reviews for Human Revolution a decade ago on Flesh Inning Zipper, and then that Mankind Divided review, and I realized that I was just not equipped to evaluate either of these games. I mean, I played them both to completion, and when it came to my Mankind Divided review, I spent half the video reminiscing about the series as a whole, and then the other half kind of just randomly listing observations of things I liked and didn't like. The Eidos Montreal games are complex creatures, and until I started working on this review I couldn't quite figure out why this game works and doesn't work, compared to the original game that I love so much. And the only reason I was able to figure that out is because, well, I made a five hour review for the Thief games, and uh, a two hour review of The Outer Worlds, and then another lengthy review figuring out why I really liked and didn't like the industry's biggest city building games. So coming around the corner to Human Revolution, it really does feel like I finally have the words to talk about this game philosophically beyond just listing off features and story beats. Where the original Deus Ex succeeds in large part is being a product of its time, of being a sparse kind of drab game that has too much going on for its own good. That leaves so much of what you do or what happens in the game for the theater of the player's mind. In Tynan Sylvester's GDC talk about his game RimWorld, he describes why it isn't a game at all, but a story generator. You see, RimWorld is a strategy game in which you build a colony on a strange alien world. It's inspired by Dwarf Fortress and looks a lot like Prison Architect. When you think you've established yourself on this strange world, the game does something to upset the balance and set you back. Sylvester doesn't want you to crest a hill progress-wise and have a solution to any problem that arises as though it's just an inconvenience like any other game. RimWorld regularly challenges you, knocking you off your feet, forcing you to create your own story about how you nearly lost your colony, or you did lose your colony, and all the gory details that go along with it, because that allows the player to create stories. I talked earlier about physical spaces, about how the original game gave you room to maneuver, about how Warren Spector commanded that you look up and down, and truly take in the game's levels to understand your objectives and plan for things, but it also forces you to draw up a space for things that aren't there too. It forces you to build your own parallel narrative and even universe that works within the logic of the game's own story that allows you to inhabit those spaces as a partner rather than an observer. That's why so many people have such a deeply held relationship with the original game, to the extent that they believe, well, that they're part of the world when they play it. I mean, it's not really a surprise to me that people really want a VR version of the game to immerse themselves. 
Human Revolution and its sequel try so hard to fill their worlds with detail that they leave little to the imagination, with red herrings and side stories that ultimately don't matter, with characters you couldn't care less about, with story beats that don't mean anything. Eidos Montreal wants to spell everything out to the letter, and you either take it as a whole, or you don't. The what of playing this game is fun, what you actually do, what the combat is like cohesively, what wandering around is like, etc. But the why is dubious. Why did Montreal make the decisions they did? The philosophical backbone of the entire series is to be presented choices and then make decisions based on your own values with consequences that you'll have to live with for the rest of the game. And why was that so limited here? Even though Human Revolution is a really good immersive sim, and it's not a bad game by any means, you should play it. And the Montreal games are indeed both worth playing. But the worst thing they did was to try and tie their game to the Deus Ex universe with its outsized expectations of any heirs. Deus Ex is a sandbox with a shovel, while Human Revolution is an ornate scrapbook of sandcastles. This game, as well dressed and highly produced and chock full of content that it is, fails to capitalize on what the player can do in their own headspace to make the place real. You have so little agency as Adam Jensen despite the countless vents that you can find and terminals you can hack. There are so many narrative spurs that tease promising conclusions and infuriate when they ultimately fail to deliver. And then there's the shape of this undeclared Adam Jensen trilogy of which Human Revolution and Mankind Divided are the first and middle acts. Playing through this game, I wonder, even if I already know the answer, if this is something Eidos Montreal said out loud, you know, dreamt of and said out loud, or is it some fantastical solace on the part of Deus Ex fans that there is some mythical narrative bridging game that ties the abrupt conclusion of Mankind Divided with the cold cybernetic world of the original game. And if such a trilogy does exist, is there a story out there waiting to be told, or would they be pulling a J.J. Abrams and making it up as they made the game to potentially dreadful results? In a recent Reddit AMA, Adam Jensen's performer Elias Defexis explained that going into the production of Mankind Divided, no one was satisfied with the story. They all thought it was boring, and they wound up completely rewriting it. It makes me wonder if their potential version of what happens in a third Adam Jensen game is really any more valid than what Deus Ex fans may have already imagined in the six years since Mankind Divided hit shelves. Is it safer that Deus Ex fans avoid even the slightest potential of disappointment if there truly is no narrative framework ready to be built on, if there is truly no conclusion ready to be revealed? Deus Ex as a series is now little more than an itchy shoulder that Eidos Montreal and Square Enix have no priority to scratch. Any further games or conclusions or fates may forever be props in a production of our own collective imagination, where we can create, well, whatever story we want. Hard to believe we've done 14 of these already. 14. It may not be the first, but it is the nth review. This is an episode, an episode number 14. An episode number number 14 for Deus Ex Human Revolution. Thank you for watching. If you've made it this far and you haven't hit the like and subscribe buttons down below, uh, I, I, would, I would ask that you do that right now. That helps me out algorithmically with the giant machines that will eventually rule the world. Uh, so that, that, just, that just helps. Uh, I have to thank my... Patreon supporters yet again for allowing this entire entire thing to happen. This helps me out monthly. Uh, it's it's great financial support. <clears throat> uh, and if you haven't checked out the Patreon, you can join and get exclusive access to Discord channels and fun stuff like the uh, Endcraft server, which you can do that with the Discord anyway. Other way, uh, up there. Um, also, you get your your name over here. If you're a producer, it's great. So check out patreon.com slash the nth review. Uh, also, you can leave me a tip. If you only want to do a one-time financial contribution, you can do that too at buymeacoffee.com slash uh, nth review. And we've got all the links down below. Uh, I'll mention the Discord again. Discord, we are having daily conversations. We are having all kinds of fun over there. And, of course, you can get access to the uh, nthcraft Minecraft server. Uh, we have tons of fun in there. We just did a server tour on the last fundraiser video, so the 24-hour one on Twitch.tv, so go check that out. And, of course, social media is everywhere, so Facebook, Twitter, 
wherever you're at, chances are I'm there updating something. Except TikTok, which is not a social network, but I guess it is. So I don't know. I don't know. What do I know? I'm an old dude. So um, thank you for making it this far. Have a great one. And hey, I'll see you next time. Pew, 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 pew. Pew, pew, pew.